the enactment of experience, even without it being real, gives the brain information the same as if they had actually done it. Expands to three times its original size. And so everything becomes expanded, accelerated. We don't look at where are you broken? We look first at what are your strengths? Ma, you know, you can't wrap me in saran wrap and protect me from the world. That social voice saying you've got to stick with him, even though he's a jerk, could bring our sadness, we could bring our grief. Hello, welcome to channel on action explorations. I'm Anna Bobikova. Our topic today is psychodrama with adolescents interview with Mario Cosa. Hi, Anna, nice to see you. New online education alert. If you're studying psychodrama and would like to learn it online with pre-recorded video formats, please check out actionexplorations.education. Watch for detailed announcement at the end of this video. Could you please uh, tell what are the benefits of working uh, using psychodrama with uh, adolescents? Well, I think there are a number of benefits. First of all, adolescents very quickly figure out whether using psychodrama works for them or doesn't. Not all kids respond to that kind of approach, but it doesn't take long for them to determine that, yeah, this, and if it works, it really works. And if it doesn't work, it really doesn't work. So you don't waste a lot of time. Several important things that for many years, certainly when I was first studying psychology, scientists believed that the brain was fully developed by the time the child reached ages of three or four. And it was later in the late 80s, early 90s, when various kinds of brain scanning technology became available, that they discovered that during adolescence, there is a tremendous resurgence in neural growth. The brain is learning new ways of dealing with data. It's learning how to negotiate a more mature relationship with others and with the world. And so it's an ideal time for working with young people who perhaps didn't have an appropriate family background. I worked with many students who were came from abuse and neglect. It's a great time for doing corrective work for students who didn't develop good attachment strategies. And also, because of what we now know about mirror neurons, that comment that my student made years ago about, wow, this is a great chance to experiment with things without having to run the risk of actually doing them, that because of mirror neurons, the enactment of experience, even without it being real, gives the brain information the same as if they had actually done it. So having the experience of doing a sociodrama or a psychodrama about the consequences of being found with drugs, for example, has the same effect on the brain as getting pulled over by the police. And so it provides real, authentic learning experiences. One of the important things about adolescence is it's a time when adults can serve a real valuable mentoring role for helping young people make meaning from experience. When we're younger, things tend to be black and white. Things are good or they're bad. During adolescence, the part of the brain, it's called the amygdala, that determines emotional significance, whether things feel good, whether they are good, whether they're bad, whether they're dangerous, whether they're safe, uh, expands to three times its original size. And so everything becomes 
expanded, accelerated. And so many people say to teenagers, you know, oh, stop being such a drama queen or stop being so histrionic. But it's really the brain trying to learn to distinguish between the shades of gray by making, by making the playing field bigger. So this is a perfect time to use enactment, whether it's psychodramatics, specifically focused on the person's actual experience, or sociodramatic, focusing on the group's common experience to really help make meaning from those experiences. It's also fun. It's better than sitting around and just talking. For I had a number of kids who were diagnosed as ADD and ADHD in my groups. And many of them found that even though during the school day they were on medication, that they could come to our group after school and not have to take their afternoon dosage of whatever medication they were put on because we weren't asking them to sit still. We were moving around, we were engaged in action, and we were meeting the students where they were instead of forcing them into an artificial setting. And the final thing that I think is really important is that psychodrama is not based on pathology. It's not, especially the therapeutic spiral model, which I, you know, I'm a trainer in, we don't look at where are you broken? We look first at what are your strengths? What are your abilities? How can we help you get in touch with your abilities and your strengths and make use of them to deal with the challenges of life? So these are all reasons that make psychodrama ideal, I believe, for working with adolescents. By any chance, could you please share the research on this topic? So, Anna, I'm not really aware of very much research that's been done with psychodrama with adolescents. That doesn't mean there isn't any. I'm just not aware of it. But I will tell you of one specific research project that was done 30 years ago by a friend of mine, Dr. Sally Ember, for her doctoral dissertation, decided to do what's called an ethnographic research study which means that she became a participant observer in the groups that I was running in New Hampshire. And she took copious, copious notes and watched the themes that were evolving within the group, not based on what she thought should be happening, but seeing what actually happened. And her doctoral dissertation, I love the title of it, the, especially the first part of the title, I am more who I am here than I am anywhere. And what Sally found was that in our groups that we were running, she used the phrase differential authenticity. And she found that students were able to identify the fact that within their day-to-day -day environment in school, that very often because of peer pressure and the need to fit into the social norms, they were not able to be fully authentic. But in our groups, because of the sense of safety that they felt and the sense of connection that they talked about, not that we thought that they were connected and safe, but they talked about being connected and safe. They were really able to explore fully who they really were. And this was 30 years ago that this was done. This was before a lot of the current thinking about of gender identity and sexual orientation was yeah. really part of the mainstream. And she found that within our group that people were really able to explore gender identity fully, sexual orientation, and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a group for gay or lesbian, bisexual, yeah. transgendered students, but students were able to look at those issues. I can remember 
uh, one young man who identified as heterosexual, but who liked to wear makeup. And in the group, he could do that because nobody cared. Yeah. You know, people were really able to explore who they were. And part of this was because through sociodrama, which is, you know, the group part of psychodrama, people can try out roles without having to say, this is me, and see how people respond. And then say afterwards, people go, wow, that was cool. And then they could say, well, yeah, that's really how I feel. The other thing that I think was really essential that our groups offered that most groups and therapy for teenagers didn't, at least at that time, was that we had norms of confidentiality that we shared with parents and students before the group began, that unless a student was being hurt by someone, was hurting themselves, or in danger of hurting someone else, we would not share any information with parents or teachers or anyone outside of the group that the students shared within the group. Absolute confidentiality. And uh, if a student, even within our agency, if a student was also working with an individual therapist within our agency, we would only communicate with that therapist with the knowledge and consent of the student. And if I would run into someone's teacher, for example, on the street, and they would say, oh, I heard that Anna is in your group. And I would say, yes, yeah, she is. I would tell you, I would say, Anna, I ran into your science teacher the other day, and she said she heard you were in the group, and I acknowledge that you were. And then you would say to me, well, why are you telling me that? That's not important. And I would say, well, no secrets, Anna. You know, anytime someone talks to me about you, I'm going to tell you. And by having this level of respect for the autonomy and confidentiality of these young people, they knew that they were free to be fully who they were and to fully share what was going on for them within this safe and confidential setting. Okay, now my favorite question. How do you use psychodrama in work with adolescents? All right, so there's, first of all, when I teach psychodrama, I talk about psychodrama with a capital P, which includes psychodrama with a lowercase p, which is exploration of someone's personal material. It includes sociodrama, which is exploration in action of social issues, and it includes sociometry, which is a term Moreno coined for exploring the interpersonal connections within a group and activities that help to build interpersonal connection. So we use psychodrama, sociodrama, and sociometry all as a way of building connections and exploring issues. Certainly, we use psychodrama and sociodrama to explore common issues. One of the things I sometimes do is an activity that we call parent-kid circle. I do this both with adolescent groups and with parent groups. If we're in a room together, or even uh, virtually, we can imagine that we're sitting in a circle and person one initiates the scene as the parent, person two becomes the kid. And so if I were person one and you were person two, I might turn to you and say, Anna, did you get your homework done? I see you sitting watching a television program and I'm not sure you got your homework done. And then you respond as the kid. And we carry the scene for about 30 seconds and then we pause you become the parent, you turn to the person next to you, and you initiate another scene. And then we say, okay, what are some of the common issues? And then from that, we pick the issue that's hot for the group. One story that I love telling is that one day when we did this, the issue that came up was teenagers, particularly older teenagers, 16, 17, who felt their parents were over-controlling. And there was this one young man in the group who decided to do a psychodramatic enactment 
of talking with his mother, who he felt was a little bit over controlling. We'll, we'll call him Chris. All right, so Chris is on the stage, and I had an intern that year, a brilliant dance movement therapy intern named Amy Williams, and she was playing his mother. And at one point, Chris turned to her and said, Ma, you know, you can't wrap me in saran wrap and protect me from the world. And Amy had this flash of idea. She knew that in the kitchen of our space, there was a roll of saran wrap. She quickly ran in, grabbed the saran wrap, and as Chris was talking, she started wrapping him up and fastening him to the chair with saran wrap. And he said, you know, I can't breathe, Ma. I can't, I can't move. You need to accept the fact that I'm 17. I might make mistakes, but... And then finally, Chris just burst out of the saran wrap and said, I'm not a baby anymore. So, wonderful scene. The wonderful story about this scene is that the next group that Chris came to, we were doing our check-in at the beginning of the group. And Chris turned to us and he said, did you call my mother? I said, no. He said, well, you're not going to believe this. And he looked at people in the group and he said, when I got home, my mother said to me, you know, Chris, I've been thinking, you're 17 and maybe I'm being a little overprotective of you. And, and so I need to give you a chance to me. He said, how did you do that? <laughs> Wow. Chris, the time was right. There is magic in psychodrama. When we create the kind of energy field in which we're ready to move on, it broadcasts. And so the work that you did, you know, perhaps you walked into the, the house a different person than the, the boy that you left the house and your mother could see the young man in you and was able to respond to that. So that's, you know, one story that I love to tell. Another thing that we do a lot is that adolescents uh, often are in a place of ambivalence where they feel pulled in several different directions. And so we do intrapsychic or internal psychodrama where we have someone play the voice that's saying, you've got to stay in that relationship because if you don't have a boyfriend, people will think you're weird, you know? And this was especially true back pre Alanis Morissette, which is when our groups began. I really give her a lot of credit for giving young women voice to say, wait a minute, this is not okay. But we experienced a lot of the young women who really define themselves in terms of their boyfriends. And we would be able to give them the opportunity to hear that social voice saying, you've got to stick with him, even though he's a jerk or he's controlling or whatever. And the voice that's saying, wait a minute, you don't need to put up with that. And to really hear those voices and to have a conversation with those voices, to be able to make different choices from the choices that the social norm pushes them into. I worked for a number of years with a, a post high school program for Balinese youth. And we would do what Moreno called social atom work, where people look at the different elements of the people who are in their lives and the connections you have with them and how they serve you and how they don't serve you. And there were wonderful opportunities. When we first started doing this, I remember one young woman who, we did it on paper first, people drew their social atoms and then she volunteered to put her social atom into action. And as she was picking people to play the different characters in her life, the students were kind of giggling because they had never done this before. And then at one point, she picked someone to play her father, who had died when she was, I think, seven or eight years old, but with whom she still had a very real connection. And Balinese youth are Hindu. And within the Hindu culture, the concept of our ancestors being very present in our lives is very real. 
it's not just an imagined thing. There is a festival every year where we celebrate the return of the spirits of the ancestors to visit us and support us. And so I said to the group, you know, I know that this is fun and we're, we're doing something new. But before she picks someone to play her father, I want you to know that when you invite someone in to play the spirit of someone who's deceased, you're actually inviting that spirit into the room as well. And so we need to do that with respect. And at that moment, the room became totally silent. It was like we were in a, a, a ceremony, a ritual. And she invited this young man in to play her father. I'm getting very uh, teary just thinking about it because as soon as he stepped into the action space, she began to cry and she held him and they both started crying together. The whole room started crying. And she said, oh, you know, in Indonesian, you know, Papa, I miss you so much. And she brought in to the group, which was such a gift, the fact that we could have all of our feelings present, not just the fun ones, but we could bring our sadness, we could bring our grief, and we could really explore fully. Uh, and it was interesting because someone said to me, oh, the Balinese are not very good at sharing their feelings. You're not going to be able to do much psychodrama <laughs> with these students. And I said, oh, I'm not so sure about that. And this was really an opportunity to know that this kind of methodology works. I have yet to encounter a culture in which people are not able to respond when presented in a thoughtful, caring, and safe manner. Wow, thank you. Thank you for sharing this. This story is so touching. And now, as usually in each video, we are going to do a little demonstration. If you'd like to learn psychodrama online from leading trainers, affordably and at your own pace, go to actionexplorations.education. This is my project to expand access to the best trainers in the world. It's my baby. We are working with the leading psychodrama trainers to present pre-recorded programs. The programs will include lecture, cases, and evaluations. There will be a large selection of action exploration subjects. I'm going to add from five to 10 modules per month, so the content will be very rich. Namaste. If you are interested in learning more about work with adolescents, we are going to record with Mario the full course on that topic. It should be on Action Explorations Education in spring 2020.